السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, I hope that you are well, feeling well, doing well, and excelling well. I was talking yesterday in Arabic about my shame. Why I'm talking about this subject? I was in Sudan a week ago, invited by uh, the Islamic call organization, Manazam al-Dawa, al Islamia, and they wanted me to talk about my experience on the World Humanitarian Summit. And the way I was presented by the master of ceremony really broke my neck, saying that uh, His Excellency uh, did so and 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 so. It was so much the international expert, the one so and so. I thought that listening to this flatter on me, I had to change my subject and let them to see and hear my awrat, which is the things that nobody can see. And this was a discussion yesterday, and this was a discussion last week in uh, Khartoum. Today you call it my shame. What do you mean by shame? People feel shameful if they do something in the dark that they don't want anybody to see. If they do hurt somebody, if they insult somebody, if they step on the foot of somebody else, they feel some time when they become conscious of what they have done. People feel shameful, this is the definition in English, when they are arrested because they become criminal, because they have done something wrong to the society. That's why they start to feel this kind of guilt. People feel shame if somebody watch or see their private parts. Say, oh my God. And they cover up quickly. And they become shy and blush. Too many definitions of shame in the English dictionary. In my experience, the last time, not the last, at least one of the many times that I feel shameful to myself, I was in Pakistan two years ago. And I visited Islamic Leaf office in Islamabad, then Bindi. I was sitting with the orphan officers and on the way out I found somebody who has a goat and a monkey. And you know in Pakistan these people actually like nomad going around to raise fund. I was sitting in the car and the man was begging me and others but I looked at the eyes of the monkey who was so hungry and so tired and so thirsty and his eyes broke my neck or cut my throat. The way he looked at me it was very painful to me. Because I could not, I didn't give the money, uh, give the man some money. And we left by the car because we are VIP. When I went to the office, I felt the shame. Shame on me. Not to help the monkey, not to help the goat. Because they are the silent slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for two, three weeks, I was trying to call the office in Islamabad to find this man and put money to give it to him. And they're still feeling the shame up till now because of the look of the monkey on me or to me. These are some definitions of shame or painful emotion caused by consciousness of guilt, shortcoming or improperty. The susceptibility to such emotion have you, uh, have you no shame. Another definition Okay, be humiliated, disgraced, ignominy when somebody arrested. Sometimes that brings censor or reproach and many and many definitions feeling pity of what you have done. 
These are some of the definition of fame, sorry, of shame in the English dictionary. Let us start about some examples. Prophet ﷺ once upon a time was standing in the darkness of uh, night with his wife, Safiya. May Allah be pleased with her. And Prophet ﷺ wanted to clear any misconception about him standing with a woman at night. Some, some Sahaba, companion of the Prophet, were pass, bypassing him. Automatically, he told them, this is Safiya, this is my wife. So they said, well, no, Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, but he didn't. Prophet ﷺ said this, why? Because he did not want the devil to come and let them to think badly about him. So it be shameful later on. This is unfortunately what happened to Hazrat Aisha radiallahu anha in the Hadith al-Ifq and Surah al-Nur. When some rumors have been mentioned about her and she was feeling shame later on, Prophet sallallahu was feeling, the community was feeling and split on the incident. The other example actually, Prophet sallallahu alayhi sent somebody called Ibn al to a tribe called uh, 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 Azad, uh, uh, Ibn Adbiya to Azad, Azad, uh, Azad tribe to collect the cat and sadaqat. And when he came back, he told the Prophet, this is for you as the cat and sadaqat, and this was given to me as a gift. Prophet Sallallahu swiftly said to him, if you sit in your house, the house of your mother or your father, nobody will give you any money. He gave a statement, a declaration, a foundation for the principles of social work in the community. If you are appointed to do this, all what you do is for the community, by the community and to the community. Then he said to him and to everybody else, such people will take this kind of gifts from the community, from the community, will come to the front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carrying it on their shoulder. Could it be a camel? Could it be a goat? Could it be a cow? Could it be a piece of land? Could it be a building? Could it be money? And he will carry it on his shoulder. So imagine that if you have, or if we have stolen or taken unlawfully 5,000 acre, 2,000 acre, 1,000 acres, imagine how this individual, such as myself, can come and carry this in front of Allah, and Allah make him to what is held. And this was a declaration of the Prophet Sallallahu as a principle for social work uh, 1,400 years ago. These are the types of shame, physical shame we mentioned when, you know, the Adam and Eve, when uh, they ate from the tree, they felt shame because they found their awrat. Or uh, they felt that this should, should cover it. And this was in the English dictionary. They covered it with uh, uh, fig leaves. Uh, in the Arab dictionary, they cover it with walaq tooth. Okay? And this was actually the physical part of it. When somebody... Uh, commit adultery in the evening or da dark rooms and whatever you call it. Ah, oh, this was not in the, in the dark room and whatever. This is actually the. Uh, so they discover it and this the physical one of it. The second one in the family. When. We have some privacy in the family. Sometimes we feel ashamed if the neighborhood know the differences or the fight between my father and my mother or the fight between the children or the disrespect of the children to the parents or what the children are doing outside, boys and girls, of shameful things. So they cover up for this kind of shame. They cover up for this kind of shame. Okay, this is in the family. Even they, they cover it from the very close neighborhood and very close family friends. If, if my son or my daughter is going out with someone, 
drinking, gambling, stealing, we cover up for it because it's shameful in the, to the family and for the family. Ethical, the, 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 the more our societies become complicated, the less ethical we become. And I mentioned this example yesterday about my landlady in the 70s. When I came to England, I was live to, to UK, I was living in Aberystwyth in Wales. She was a very nice woman. She was a very nice woman. She was a widow. She has got two young, beautiful girls, 18 and 16. And they are very good behaved. Have got very good behavior. Don't have boyfriend, don't drink, don't, don't, don't do all these kind of things that the boys and the girls do at this age. And she was telling me, honey, because I was living in her guest house as her son. She, says, she told me this is the only group of girls in Aberystwyth, about 8 or 10 or 12, who don't have girlfriend, who don't go out alone, who don't drink, because they go as one group. I brought them this way, stricting to the value of the British society at the time. Okay? But soon my son, they go to university, I don't have any control on them. So the value will be different, changing. And this will affect our ethics and our moral system. Even at that time or before, I remember that Sunday was a holiday. No shops should be open. It's holy, 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 holy. Going to the church, having Sunday lunch, no shopping at all, even don't hang the clothes on Sunday. Because this is not, in this holiday you don't put your uh, clothes on uh, outside. So this kind of things okay, actually was actually uh, uh, valuing the value of Sunday as it is. So this is the ethics of it. So societal, which is what, this is why I mentioned this to the people in, in, in Khartoum and this. Soon you become a public figure. Soon you become responsible for a society, community, organization, ministry, country. Soon you become a king or a queen, a minister, prime minister, a teacher, professor, and so on, head of organization, board member, chairman, president of organization, and so on. You are accountable to every and any individual. Here I can talk about myself. When we started the Islamic League 33 years ago, I was very aggressive. I was very rough. Sometimes I was very rude. I was very scary. I was very dictator-like. Anybody else and more. Even to a point that scared people that when they hear my voice walking in the corridor, they hide, they run, they go to the toilet and switch off the light. They don't want to see me. This is how bad I was as a president or a chairman or a founder. Even unfortunately, one of them wet himself in the toilet at that time. See how bad I was? But nowadays, people are still doing this. And they get away with it. This on the individual basis. On the decision basis, dictator can take an individual decision without consulting anybody. This is my decision. This is my say. This is my right. And you follow me. Why should we contradict and uh, uh, criticize a dictatorship leadership? a dictator leadership, and we do not criticize a dictator leadership inside our civil society organization, particularly who are working the charitable sector, whether the founder or a chairman or a board member or a CEO or whatever he is or she is. Once upon a time, 
1995, we used to spend money, right, left, and center, because we don't have a proper budget, a proper and strong accounting department at that time, policy and procedures. And at that year, I think 94 or 95, I was responsible for making all the mess of overspending from different fund to different area. Nearly, we put Islamic Leaf on its knees at that time. But Alhamdulillah, the trustees realized that and they formed or they established the uh, board of management to control my activity and control me. In a proper organization at that time, if we have a good proper setup and good organization uh, uh, structure, I should have been sacked. I should have been sacked. But the board of management controlled me, alhamdulillah, and we started to save the organization. Because I was the decision maker. I was the founder. I was the dictator. And people were scared to confront me. This is very important. We talk about the founder syndrome, the chairman syndrome, we have to make them accountable to every little and big things that they are doing. If you become responsible for the community, you do not rise above the community. You rise for the community. Never ever, never ever rise above the community, but rise for the community. Because the community appointed you, society appointed you, nation appointed you to become responsible. So when you become responsible, you are responsible to them. So they can ask you anything they want. And they have got any citizen in the country have the right to question me, to question you as a responsible individual. And they have no right of not responding to them. And this is what we call transparency. Transparency, as I said earlier on, is what you feel shame if people see. If you don't have anything to feel shame about, take off all your clothes because there's no aurat. There's nothing to hide. There's no fault. There's no mistakes. But why should we cover up? Become public servants. Why should we cover up? Because this is not your money. These are the money of the poor, the displaced, the refugees, the destitute, the sick, the elderly, the women, the widows, the orphans. This is their money. How dare we deal unlawfully in their money? I thought to say some of my mistakes in the 90s and more mistakes I have done. To let you realize as citizen, realize as employees, realize as other organization, that those superstars make mistakes. They are not just superstars with no sins. Even some of the prophets, peace be upon them, all of them, did make mistakes. And they came back to Allah and they repented. Moses, alayhi salam, killed the Egyptian and he was going to kill the second Egyptian before running away from Egypt. And so on, other prophets have done. Even the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad ﷺ, once upon a time he was visited by the chief tribes, chief of the tribes in Quraysh. And Abdullah ibn Maktoum was coming as a blind man and they were treating him differently. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reprimanded the Prophet ﷺ in Surah Abasa wa Tawalla and Ja'ul Amma. He became yani, not welcoming the blind man, but welcoming the chief of the tribe, and became one chapter in the Quran to give us the guidance that even the prophets, peace be upon them, were actually so transparent to all the community. Who are you? How dare you are? As a president or a chairman or an MP or a lord or whatever it is that you deal with public money, with public trust, and you have this shameful behavior 
and you do not disclose it to the society. So you don't become accountable to them. Our talk today is not about history. It's about our current affair, our current time, our current situation. Quite often I used to insult people, unfortunately. But sometimes people remind me. So what I, you know, what I used to do? To come back to the same individual in public and they say, I'm sorry. Difficult on the heart, but has to be done. We have to learn this. We have to learn this. If you make something bad, if you shout at somebody, we used to fight inside the organization. And they used to let many people to cry. But I used to feel the guilt because of my bad behavior. Because of my bad behavior as a founder, a chairman, a president, a CEO, whatever you call it. Nobody above mistakes. But we should be correcting our mistakes. We should be learning from our mistakes. We should be changing our mistakes into something good. Okay? I think the first hadith of Ibn al was some of the examples that Prophet ﷺ was mentioning, but the, the hadith which I wanted to admit at the very beginning is the hadith that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cover up for your sin in the evening and you disclose it next day. Why? Okay? This is actually another hadith, but I don't want to confuse you with this one nowadays. Other hadith about accountability and transparency is when, when Umar ibn Khattab was appointed, he stood up on the member and said, whoever finds a mistake in me, please correct me. Someone, which without mentioning the name of this someone in the history said, we will correct you with our swords, Umar. Umar did not take it as a revenge because he was not a dictatorship style uh, Amir. He said, Alhamdulillah, God, Alhamdulillah, thank God that I have among the people in the room, in the mosque, somebody can stand up and correct me by his sword if I've done a mistake. The same Omar, one, the, one day he was standing, he was a tall man, very well built. And they were distributing clothes to everybody with certain share. And because of the size and the height of Omar, the size and the height of Omar, okay, Somebody stood up and said, that, how can you have two pieces of cloth and each one of us has been given one piece? And he asked his son to stand up, Abdullah, to my son, tell them the story. Abdullah, his son said, okay, I gave him my piece. So my father have got the two pieces together to make his dress. The man was satisfied of this transparency and accommodation to the other point. Even he was, he was talking about the dowry for the woman. A woman stood up, said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that we can take as much as we can if the man provides us with a dowry. And he said, he, he accepted the woman's opinion in the mosque in front of everybody. So he's allowing the discussion in the most democratic way or sure way that we're talking about. This is the attitude of Omar on transparency, accountability as a president or as a leader. Nobody above mistakes. But once we commit a mistake or a sin, we regret, we repent, and we correct ourselves. Last point of Omar, which is his relationship with one of his relatives, Khalid bin Walid, was a great conqueror. And when Omar was appointed, he was making him accountable to every mistake he has done. And he sacked him from the leadership of the army. Then he looked at his income when he was the leader of the army, or the chief of, chief, uh, or field general or marshal, uh, uh, field marshal of the Muslim army at that time. This is how the leadership make themselves accountable to the public. 
If you become a public figure, you have to become very transparent because you don't have to have a shameful thing inside you that you're doing it in the dark. And the sa'awrat or the shameful thing that we're doing should not be a part of the leadership quality. So if we come back to the first slide, my shame is, as a public figure, I have to correct it, to make myself accountable to the public, to make myself accountable to my colleague, to make myself accountable to my relatives and my sons and my daughters, my neighborhood, because people will look at me as a public figure. Once you become a public figure, that means that the community trusts you. That means the society trusts you. That means that the nation trusts you. That means that the membership trusts you. And you have nothing to hide in front of them. So you should be very transparent, ultra transparent, and all the activities and the action, and you be accountable to them for everything you say and everything you spend on behalf of the company, on behalf of the organization, on behalf of the country, on behalf of the institution that you are running or you are a part of it. So coming back to finish, my appeal to all the charitable organization, most of civil society organization in the Middle East and in the Arab world and the so called themselves Islamic, please raise the standard of transparency, please Raise the standard of accountability. Please confirm the governance standard and empower the people in the organization to run it. And if the time comes to you, you don't fight to stay. You say, please, come and take over. And this is what should be the attitude of the leadership of the organization. Transparency, accountability, creating future leadership, being humble, show humility, and being responsible before the God, the Creator, before the community, before the organization, and before the public. You are not there to become, to be worshipped by the organization, or to be worshipped by the society or the community, or to be feeling that you are a sacred man. Secrecy is not for us. Secrecy is for the prophets of God only. Not for you and me as a civil servant and as community worker and as social worker. Thank you very much for listening to my shame or to my shameful experience. And I hope that I myself don't do it again. And I hope that you and the others don't fall in this trap because of the fame or the power or the prestige we have when we run organization, especially public organization. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. See you next week, inshallah.